Good morning, everybody. Uh, Fergus Dolan here from NALA, the National Adult Literacy Agency. We're delighted to have you here this morning for our webinar on ESOL students with literacy issues, where to start. And uh, we're delighted to welcome Susan Clancy. Hi, Susan. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, Susan is the ESOL coordinator with um, Blanchetown Adult Education Service, which is part of um, Dublin and Dunleary ETB. So Susan will be presenting, but she did say a few times she's going to show things and I'm going to look for your feedback and comments. So please unmute and say what you think or give your ask your questions or give comments or in the chat box, uh, write in your comments, your feedback for Susan in the chat box and I can read them out, Susan. So uh, we're roughly due uh, to go for an hour. So over to you, Susan, and all the best. Great. Oh, thanks very much, Fergus. So yeah, you're in the right place. ESOL students with literacy problems, where to start. And um, so yeah, I'm Susan, and I would love you guys to, you know, go ahead and put things in the chat and sh shout things out. If if I'll let, it might help Fergus um, to help me with keeping an eye on the chat. So if I don't in initially respond to you, I'm not ignoring you, you know. And um, so you're very welcome. So a little bit of an introduction about me. Um, this is the Adult Education Center in Blanchestown where I work. And I started off, I've been there for about 20 years, started off as a literacy tutor. And then for the last 10 years, I've been working mainly as an ESOL tutor. And the last five, I've been the ESOL coordinator there. And I have about 12 ESOL teachers on my team. So these are a few of the courses we run in Blanchardstown. Um, we do ESOL at QQI level three. We do ESOL at the elementary level and ESOL at beginning level A1 to A0. Um, and then we do ESOL classes for students who have literacy issues. We call them wild classes, which sounds like wild, but it's, it just means with literacy difficulties. That's our short synonym for it. So if I refer to the classes as being wild, I don't mean wild and crazy. I mean, literacy difficulties, okay? It's a mouthful to continue to say that. So, so that's, that's a little bit about me. And it's the bottom one we're gonna focus on today. And I kind of tried to clarify the difference between an A0 class and an A, you know, the class of, of wild students, people with literacy problems. So this is what we're gonna cover in the nutshell today. Um, how do students, um, with literacy problems present in the classroom. We're gonna talk about building community in the classroom. And we're gonna talk about ideas and resources for teaching at this level. And then look at what success looks like at this level. And then hopefully if there's time, we can take some questions. Uh, but if you do have questions throughout, like about a particular slide, feel free to jump in there and we can we can also take questions you know, as we go along. So, okay. so. To start with, um, I just want you to have a look at this application form, okay? Usually when a student comes into a class, they're even are met with a smiling teacher and she's handing out pens and handing out application forms. If you were someone that has literacy problems, the application form might look something like this. So I want you to have a look at that and think, how would you feel if you're in a group situation everybody's getting these forms, everybody's writing. Would you pretend like you knew what that said? Um, would you guess, like you can kind of make out there, it says PPS number. And so just kind of keep that in mind, that feeling of being handed a piece of paper and having no idea what is on that piece of paper. And, and then I'm gonna show you, um, here it is in English. So compare how you feel now, with the second application form where you might recognize obviously you you know you're you you see it so you, there's a bit of relief so keep in mind those two sets of feelings because adults ESOL students with literacy problems it's they might understand some things and there's that sense of getting a piece of paper where they don't understand anything and then they might pick be able to pick up a few things and that sense of like emotionally that feeling of what that's like and just keep that in mind kind of as we, as we move along. And um, so we'll look, start with the first one here. So how do students present in the classroom? In other words, what do we mean when we say literacy difficulties? So in other words, how is this class different from 
an absolute beginner class, an A0 class where students have no English at all. And so what we mean is a student who cannot read or write in their own language, as well as not being able to read and write in English or, or speak in, in, in English. Um, usually these students never attended school in their own country. Um, the reasons for that could be their country was at war, gender expectations. In some countries, girls aren't entitled to an education. Um, they could have an unstable government in their country. Family situations, migration, um, maybe the family was on the move and they never got quite caught up in, um, or caught up with their education if they missed out on those pivotal years. Um, nationality wise, for us, a lot of what we see in these classes are Afghanis and Somalis and Nigerians as well, which I'll get, I'll get to that a little bit later. But um, so that's the difference between um, an A0 class and a literacy class. The students have never, um, never been in school before. And because of that, students have a wide range of emotions because it's, they're coming into a new situation for them. And, and they need to learn how to be students. That's number three there. Um, so that's something you're gonna have to teach as well. One of my tutors tells a story about she was starting a, an ESOL literacy class and she's handing out pens and papers to everybody. And the student, one of the students grabbed the pen like this, nearly like how a baby would hold a pen. So that might be your starting point. It might even be like teaching them, you know, we hold the pen like this, how much pressure we put down on the paper because sometimes the student will press really hard on the paper and rip the paper. So that could be your starting point and you have to be aware of that. You're teaching them to be students. So the difference between A0 class and this level is A0 students, they've been to school in their country. They know how to come to class on time, break pen and paper, show up on time. Whereas these guys, you'll have to teach them. That's part of your role as well. And the good news is it's never too late. It doesn't matter when you start. You can, you can always learn these things, but just to kind of be aware of that and not be frustrated by that because it's not you just telling them one time, but every week you might have to remind them to bring their glasses, bring their paper. We would find students would forget again and again the day of their class, the time of their class, because it's just a new situation for them and something that they're not used to. So um, yeah, so they need to learn how to be students. So that's one of the ways that they present. Um, they have various ability levels as well. Some students can speak English well, but can't write in any language. Some can neither speak in English or write in any language. And in my career, I've been fooled by that first group before because you'll meet a student and think that they have good English because they could speak so well or good. And then they get into class and I realize, no, really, they, they need to be in a literacy class. And the nationality with that, we find a lot of Nigerians in that category. They're great speakers, but not good writers. So we have classes for both. Um, and if you're in a class, if you're teaching a class where students can speak well, you can move at a, a different clip than you can with weak speakers, but you can certainly, it's just a matter of identifying that. And, and just on that note too, I didn't, I, we did this seminar on Saturday. We had a great day um, at the Ashing Hotel on Saturday. And one of the things that came up, which I just wanted to mention to you guys is how we assess students at this level. So how, how do you know somebody's with literacy difficulties or just an A0 learner? And the way we assess everybody that comes into the Lanchers Town, they fill out a course inquiry form and then we give them a, a ring or a text to ask them to come in to meet them and do an English um, pen and paper um, test so we can learn their level. Lots of times people can do the test at all, and that's absolutely fine. But um, you will kind of try to ask them then, when did you leave school in your country? And a lot of times, you know, people will shake their head and say, you know, I've never been to school. So that's, it, that's it just by asking them, what age did you leave school or when did you leave school? Um, and then we can kind of guess by nationalities as well. If it's European, um, like Lithuanian or Polish or, and they, they can't speak any English. We can kind of guess that they've been to school, but 
it's not an exact science, but that's just kind of how we do it. And if we make a mistake and put somebody in the wrong class, then once they're in a class, the teacher can always refer them back and we can move them to, to a class at this level. But that's kind of the difference. I think there was some confusion on Saturday. So we're not talking about absolute beginners here. We're, you know, it's a different level of class here. Okay, so I will move on here. Um, I just want to think for a minute about talking, I want to talk about building community in the classroom. And this is where I want you guys to have a think. And, and if you want to shout out, building community in the classroom is important for everybody. Obviously, every class you want people to feel comfortable. But why do you think at this level, it would be particularly important that students feel connected with each other and with um, with the teacher and with one another and it's kind of it's kind of common sense in the sense of they they're particularly vulnerable in the sense that they may have been hiding the fact that they have literacy problems so to appear in class they are they're really making themselves vulnerable so um yeah so building community is is really important um Besides teaching English, you're hopefully fostering friendships in the class, and that can sometimes be as important as learning English. Sometimes people that come into class, this might be the only thing that they do for themselves all week, and this group of people might be the only group of people that they've gotten to know outside their family. And um, so you have to make the class something that they really don't want to miss, you know, make that community feeling so strong that they want to make sure that they don't miss. Otherwise, absenteeism is going to be a problem. You can imagine if they don't feel comfortable coming to class, that's going to be one more obstacle of getting them there. So building community is really important. And I'm going to share with you some ways we've done that in our school, in our situation, particularly with these classes. But if you guys have ideas as well, I'd be anxious to hear what you have to say. So one way we build community is structuring the classroom. We keep the classes small. In this particular level, we only have four to six students in the classroom. In normal classes, we might have 10 or 11 in a class, but, but for this level, we, we keep it very small. And another way that we structure the classroom is we try to use a helper in our classroom. We've been lucky, lucky enough in Blanchardstown to use volunteer literacy tutors. Um, and if there's any way you can swing that, it really is a big difference. Um, why is that? Is because classes consist of a wide range of abilities. They're not exactly, obviously, all going to be at exactly the same level. So the literacy help can sit between maybe the two weakest students, and that um, that helps the class to move along at a clip faster than it would. And the other students don't get frustrated, but nobody gets left behind that way. So the ESOL tutor is the paid one. She, he or she prepares the classes. Um, and, but the literacy tutor is really an important part of the whole process. Um, she, the, the only thing about that, you just have to be careful that the tutor doesn't become a crutch to the student. So there's that balance of being patient and giving them the help they need, but also having expectations of them to do the work themselves. But it really has proven to be a great, a great help to us. Um, the other thing that came up um, in the workshop on Saturday that I wanted to mention is that, and also if there's learning difficulties, sometimes people have literacy problems because they never attended school in their country, but sometimes it's because there's other things going on there. There might be dif dyslexia, dyslexia or other issues like that. So that's not exactly our remit in this class, but if there are those type of problems, it's easier to identify them with a helper. And then from that, we can try to get that person the help they need or refer them on to get a little bit of help with their, with their learning issues. So just more eyes, the better in this type of a class. So second way we, um, we um, find it, which is helpful, is to use peer learning. So we find out which languages the students speak and allow them to sit together and help each other. So I'm just gonna read out that slide because it might be kind of hard to see. It's hard for me to see on my screen. So the, the one that starts, it says, we learn 10% we learn of what we read, 20% of what we hear, 30% of what we see and hear, 
50% of what we both see and hear, 70% of what is discussed with others, 80% of what we experience personally, and 95% of what we teach to somebody else. So I saw that in my classroom, I had a lady from Afghanistan and she, there was another lady joining, she'd been, the first lady had been in the class about six months and the second lady joined. And the, the first lady was just great to see her come alive to explain in her language to the newcomer, this is what's expected. This is what time we meet. This is, you need to bring a pen, you need to bring paper, you know, to really see her be the teacher in that situation, because I can't speak Arabic, you know, she was such a great help to me. And it really, you could see her face come alive. And this might've been one of the first times she was um, asked, you know, to help somebody in the classroom. So as much as you can, sometimes people in the English language classroom there, they want English to be spoken all the time and there's time and a place for that but I think in particularly with these groups if people share the same language I encourage you can you explain that can you help me and then you know which it is lovely and it's lovely for their confidence to see that that happening as well okay so keeping going on this theme of, of building community and we give student, students time to speak and and this is for, remember the, I was talking to you about like the wit lady that held the pen like this, their muscles get tired. Like you'll often see in this class, like after a while of writing, they'll be rubbing their hands because just the muscles aren't that established yet to, to write. So giving them time to speak, it just, it gives them a break from the writing. But plus you want to know what their needs are and how else are you going to know what their needs are unless um, you give them time to speak and, and you can, you can ask them and hear from them. And if you've got a class that are good speakers and weak writers, this is obviously a lot easier to do. But if you have a class of, of weak speakers as well, you still need to, to help them to learn to speak in your class. So it's important that you give time for that and, and give space to kind of let them say what they want to say. And hopefully you've created an atmosphere where they're, they're comfortable making mistakes. So you can get en enough of a, you know, to figure out what it is that they want to talk about. And um, so that leads on to obviously speaking leads on to listening to shared experiences. I had an, an example of that happen in one of my classes. I was teach, doing a lesson on um, how to dial 999 and how to get the ambulance service out or the guards out or whatever. And, and really all I wanted to teach them, I wanted them to be able to dial that number, say their name, say their phone number, say what the problem was. But as I listened to them speaking, I sensed that they were nervous about calling the guards or calling government officials and we they kind of chatted and I began to understand that they were afraid to to, to deal with um, government officials because of their experience in their own country and it wasn't safe for them so I really had to explain look in Ireland it's okay and it's safe you can call the guards if you need them and they'll be there to help you or the fire brigade or the ambulance service um, but I never in a million years would have thought that that would have been something I would have had to explain to them. But because I listened to their experience, you know, and it, it just it goes on and on like that. There's loads of things that and there are opportunities to teach about Irish culture. And this is where we live now. Um, so, yeah, so you're going to let them do speaking and you're going to obviously listen to their experiences. Um, the final one, the final way that we have found to build community in the classroom is just to have fun together. And we do that, like, I find a great way to do that is with food. So we will, you know, every International Women's Day or birthdays, people bring in food to eat. And that's where they get to be the expert because they're the experts on food from their own country. And that's turned into then people wanting to, to share recipes. And we've been able to kind of write down how you write down recipes and different things like that. But, um, but that, that has been great. And besides creating community in our classroom, I always try to, I want them to feel a part of the bigger school. And um, so we often will do fun things at Christmas time. We always do a, um, a raffle for Laura Lynn, or we do um, um, like international food festivals with the whole school. So it's great to get them involved in that. And I was sharing this on Saturday and somebody said, did you, do you find, because, well, when we do the raffle, I had to explain what a raffle is because they wouldn't have known that. And, you know, you're paying money for a chance to win. And I took them out and I showed them all the prizes that they could possibly win and all this stuff. 
And um, somebody said, did you find they had a problem? Some people had a problem with that because it was gambling. And I was like, well, yeah, if, uh, you know, you never obviously push anybody to do anything, but I, it's better to explain what it is. And then they can opt in and opt out anyways, because in their, their children's schools, there'll be raffles and things like that. So the learning opportunities are just kind of never ending of things you can explain, but it was fun for them to be a part of, of this. And one of the students did buy a raffle ticket this year. And one of the students from our group won a prize. So that was kind of fun, you know, and it helped them to feel a part of the bigger, the bigger picture of the school. So I know I, I feel like I'm, I'm speaking, not giving you guys much time to speak now. So is there anything that you have done or you can think of about how you build community in your classrooms or um, in your schools? If you, if there's anything you want to shout out, good ideas or, um, or anything you want to add to the chat there. People came up with some good stuff on Saturday that I wouldn't have thought of. So I don't know, maybe you have some good ideas there as well. Um, so feel free to unmute and yeah. give your suggestion to Susan. Hi, this is, um, sorry to interrupt, this is Deborah here. Um, I joined a little bit late, I, I'm sorry about that. Um, one of the things, if it has been mentioned before, apologies, is that um, at the beginning, especially when we get to know the group, they quite like a few minutes to share information, like, you know, how has their week been? Um, it's just a very simple thing. So I give them some time at the beginning, once I kind of outline the what's going on in the lesson, the plan for the day, they always kind of just have that few minutes to just share you know what they've done during the week or I might give them a theme that they can choose and they kind of share uh, some information and I, and I find as they get to know one another slowly over the time um, that's really kind of helped really for them to get to know one another. Yeah that's great yeah thank you that's really good yeah. Has anybody else got anything that they find has worked well for them to for their class to get to know each other? Hi, um, sorry, yes. Um, one thing I found worked really well was in the class that I had, um, it was a two hour class, which is way too long. So in the middle, we'd have a 20 minute break and they would make tea and coffee and lay the table. It was a bit of a ceremony in the middle of the class and it really broke down barriers of them to get to know it's your turn, it's his turn. And even the men getting them to take the cups and put them over to the sink. It yeah. was in the class, or it was, you know, it was great. It was really good. It was just a focus that just changed the pace of everything in the middle of the, and it was long enough for them to get a bit of a break. And yeah, it was good. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. That's great. Thanks, Mary. Um, just on that, I think Mary makes a good point about two hour classes being long for this level. We tend to keep it to an hour and a half at the most. And then even in that, having a little 10 minutes chat 15 minute chat in the middle because people do get tired you know particularly at this level so yeah um another thing that came up which wasn't my idea but i thought this was great on saturday was they were talking about sharing hobbies because you always like people say you know what they like to do for fun and one lady um crochet was her hobby and she then from that brought in the needles and was showing people how to do it. And a couple of the ladies took up that hobby as well. So that's always a nice way too, to, to share, um, you know, look at them to share hobbies and encourage them if they have something that's possible to bring into the class to do it. And they can show the class how they, you know, what their hobby is. So I thought that was a great, great idea. So, um, the next section I want to focus on here is resources and ideas and I know this is probably the one reason why everybody came to this seminar today because I know for me whenever I go to to workshops or webinars it's like give me something to take away that I can teach with this week and um, unfortunately resources appropriate to ESOL learners with literacy issues are kind of difficult to find a lot is child-centered and a lot is focused on native English speakers and maybe not foreign nationals so the ESOL tutor must adapt materials and write their own materials a lot. And I do have 
um, I do have some recommendations for you of things that you can adapt. And I have some recommendations or to kind of show you some different ideas of what I've done. So you won't go away empty handed. There will be some things that you can take away and hopefully be able to use in your classrooms this week. Um, but before we do that, now those are, I'm also going to need your, your chat. I'm going to show you a worksheet that I did, which is terrible. Uh, it's not good for this level. So I'm going to put it up now and I want you to have a read of it and tell me, you won't hurt my feelings because I know it's not good. <laughs> tell me what I've done wrong and hopefully in seeing what I've done wrong, we can kind of learn some things of what we can do, right? So again, feel free to jump in there with, have, take a minute to read it, but then feel free to jump in there with your chat and your, um, you know, unmute and say what you think. What do you think? What, 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 what jumps out at you immediately to say, mm, I don't think that would work well with my, with a class at this level. Putting present simple tense at the top, I mean, that presumes a lot of knowledge, which a lot of Irish people don't have much less. Yeah. Yeah, Irish university graduates don't know what present yeah. simple tense yeah. is, you know, so yeah. Yeah, that's one, very good, yeah. Hi there, Susan, it's Christina here. Um, Hi, yes, yeah. I, I thought about that one as well. Um, and also perhaps, um, just you know the assumption, the assumptions that there are there around the the person's profession and perhaps where they live as well. So, a lawyer in Manhattan that might mean an awful lot to someone who's who doesn't have that geographical yeah. understanding or, or the understanding of the role either. Um, so there's just just a few assumptions in that. But as you said, you made it that way for us to pick them up. Yeah, and her, her hobby, that's great, Kristen. Her hobby too is she enjoys going out for dinner and drinks with her friends. So probably not going to relate very well to our students, you know. So yeah, look at two guys. The what do you think about the font and the spacing of those ones? Yeah, the the line breaks are you know it's just very cluttered, too much text, too small. Yeah, and the engagement the engagement would be low. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, and also fill in the missing vowels. Like, do they know what a vowel is? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there, there's a lot of things that I've, I've done wrong. Um, the space to fill in the answers to, you know, like little teeny weeny. But you know, when you look at, if you guys, I'm assuming you're here, you're ESOL tutors. If you look at um, an ESOL book like Headway, Cutting Edge. I mean, they're great books, but the spaces to fill in the answers, even for somebody who's quite literate, is they're tiny. Like, you know, they're trying to cram as much in. And I even find my eye, it's a lot of words on the page, you know. And a few other things, like I've put in a lot of exercises on the one page, which probably isn't good. And I put in instructions. I think somebody mentioned that present simple tense, not good. So let me show you. A better one. I'm not saying it's perfect, but better. And this is one I wrote about my student. Okay, so what I did was I interviewed all my students um, in the class, and then I each day we had a spotlight on a student, and I did a few works. I did like one week about Kadiku, and, and you know another week about another student. So everybody got to be like the star student for the day. So. You know, the, the worksheet says, my name is Kadiko. I'm from Guinea. I live in Malhuddard. I live with my husband, Musa, and my two children, Irma and Mariam. My children are too young to go to school. My favorite food is fish, and my favorite drink is juice. Every Friday, I go to English class in Blanchestown. In my free time, I like to go shopping. I like living in Ireland because I have freedom. Now, that's what she said. So I wasn't me putting words in her mouth. Like when I talked to her and got information to do the worksheet for the following week, those are the things that she said. And you might think Mulhuddard is a big word or Blanchardstown is a big word, but that's our community. That's where we live. So those would be the kind of, even if it's a difficult word, um, it's our area. So it's important they know Mulhuddard, they know Blanchardstown. And they obviously her name, is 
difficult, but everybody, we know each other's names in the class anyway, so they could pronounce her name. Um, the, well, just to, to in contrast to the other one, there's no instructions on that sheet. It doesn't say read this passage. The, 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 the font is Comic Sans and it's bigger, you know, and there's spacing between each thing. And then the second page that I did is the exact same thing again, but it's a close exercise and to fill, you know, for them to look at the first sheet and copy the information to the second sheet. So I didn't put, I didn't write the passage and then put the fill in the blank under it. For each thing, I gave them a different worksheet and I did another worksheet on questions. So for each one, they like, well, I find my students, they like to look at the original passage, have that in front of them while they're writing the other one. And I know in, um, in our school, like probably most schools, they encourage us to, to copy on both sides, but I find that really hard with this level because the flipping the page and look at, wait, what does this say? What does this say? You know, so I do give them one sheet, one sheet, and there's no instructions there. Don't, I don't put the, I just tell them what to do now. And so, so that's a little bit um, of an idea of something you guys could do is to make a student spotlight each week and then do, you know, rather than write about some fictional person, Samantha, who works in Manhattan, let's, let's talk about each other, you know, and so that's, that's, that's some of the, the things that you could try. And um, so I just show you a little bit more um, on the resources, and then we can maybe, you know, I can, we can have a chat as well with ideas that you guys might have, but um, so let me see here. So when creating your own worksheets, like I said, don't write instructions on the top, show them what to do. Don't say, please fill in the passage or yeah, please read this passage or please fill in the vowels, you know, you're going to say it to them instead of write it. And also, um, if you can use the way on um, Saturday, we were talking a little bit about this and some of the people at the workshop suggested using soft covered paper, if possible, to photocopy on like pink or blue. And I know that's for people with learning problems as well, but it just makes it a little bit easier on the eye to, to use the soft color, colored paper. Um, number two, like in, with creating your own worksheets, keep focused on the students' needs. Now that might seem easy, but that's both what you think they need and what they think they need or what they want as well. And I have an example of that in that when I am, um, I teach this level, I always make sure that I make sure they know their name, their address, their phone number, their children's name, their PPS number, just for their own safety, because if anything happens to them, I want them to be able to write down their name, write down their husband's name or their husband's phone number or child, daughter, somebody, you know, that they can contact. The PPS number is important because every agency that they go to, they're going to be asked to write down their name and their PPS number. So um, those two, those few things I think are really important for them. And an example, uh, and we would practice that every week until I'm confident they have it. And then I feel like, yes, we got this. And then another, um, well, I want to give you an example of what one of my students wanted, what her need was. She had a son who was having a birthday and she wanted to be able to write the card herself. You know, so every week we practice, you know, you know, dear son, you know, happy birthday, love mama, you know, we'd write it and write it and write it. And then time came and the birthday came and she bought a card from the shop because we practiced so many times she was able to write it on the card in class. And it was just so nice and so fulfilling, you know, and so she was delighted with herself and I'm sure it meant a lot to her son. So that there's that balance between what you think they need, what you want to make sure you impart to them, and then also what they want, you know, so keep focus on both. Um, then, obviously, when creating, you know, teach the same idea using lots of different met methods. So you can use games, pictures, clothes exercises, puzzles, reading and discussion. I like to cut up, like sometimes, you know, in sentence structure, cut up all the words, and then they, they move them around on the page. So you might need to do a bit more of that with this level, but that's okay. Like it kind of makes the class fun to, to try. So the same lesson, if you're doing food or whatever, you can do it in many different ways. And obviously pictures are great, you know, color pictures of food and matching up with the name of the food and things like that. So yeah, pick a topic, but then do use lots of different ways to get across the same topic. And um, be aware of, of mistakes as well that are very common, um, capital, letters versus lowercase letters, um, 
you know, the B and the D are confusing, um, letter shapes, the spacing between words. Um, sometimes you'll find students will write, they won't leave any, it'll just be a straight, you know, but literally to show them to put the finger space between each word. There's a lot of, a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, use a basic writing copy. I just wanted to show you here. Um, I have got, you know, this, you know, like we would buy like for the, you know, younger kids, but if they are handy, these writing copies, I don't know if you can see that, with the blue and the red and to write, um, I've got, um, you know, one I've made bigger, you know, and you can even, why am I doing this? <laughs> um, you know, even color in kind of the, the blue and the red line with the marker or whatever, if possible, but it just helps with showing lowercase. I mean, look at that as opposed to, you know, a normal sheet of paper like that, or, or worse still, just a plain white piece of paper with no lines at all. So, you know, it, the more you can do that, the better. Um, when creating worksheets, use use color, you know, if possible, I know a lot of us don't have access to a color photocopier, but even if you had one color worksheet that you can show them, if you can photocopy theirs in black and white, and um, pictures, appropriate fonts, the Comic Sans is good. And then on Saturday, we were talking about Arial is good as well. A lot of the, the tutors there were using that. So play with it when you're making your own worksheet, you know, and you can um, see what you think you like and try it with your students and see what they say and what they find easy to, to use and to follow. Um, yeah, so those, those are a few little tips. And then use technology, like don't be afraid to use technology at this level. We're very lucky in Blanchardstown that we have iPads that we can borrow and use. So they're kind of, you know, Apple products are easy to kind of manipulate, I think, for, for students. Um, but even if you don't, most people have got smartphones that they can record their voice or they can do different things on their phone. So um, yeah, that, that, those are great. You know, don't be afraid of, of technology. Oh, sorry. Hello. Before I do that, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, I just wanna show you, this is a, a worksheet that one of my students has made called Bernie McDonald. And it's on a format called Pod Handler. And she made this during the pandemic, but you can see like the color and the, um, and then that's her down at the bottom speaking. So hopefully if I do this again, it'll, yeah, there we go. Hello. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. Would you like to do some work today, learn some English? Let's have a look. Okay, so that's, that's um, again, that's called Pod Handler. And Bernie made that during the pandemic when we were desperately trying to come up with a way to connect with these students. But as I'm saying, you could, you could make up things and then, you know, they can get them on the iPad away. So there's lots of creative, you know, fun things you can use. Um, there are good, there's like, you don't have to make everything from scratch yourself. There are really some great materials out there that you can use and you can adapt. Um, NALA's got great stuff, and I'm not just saying this because it's a NALA workshop, but even on Saturday we picked up, there's some new books that NALA has, but um, let me show you a couple of the, the Read by Now series, which I did learn on Saturday, is the books aren't available anymore, but they're available to download on PDF, and the, um, they're great, the spacing and the, the word space, you know, they're, they're a good resource. Nala also has, you know, better handwriting, sorry, I'm not showing that very well, better handwriting for adults, which is good, you know, helping um, lots of nice spacing and things for practicing writing. Um, they've got, I've got the big picture is another good one, Nala resource, paving the way is a Nala resource, but maybe the best thing to do, I'm sure Fergus might tell me, but like if, if you, have questions and say, look, this is the work group on work. Could you have any suggestions if you email Nala or write into them of things that they have, which would would be you know helpful and easy. And even even if the work is if it's not perfect for you, it's a starting point you can adapt from, you know. Then I also a couple other books that I like are this um Fiat. Uh, Fiac and Ansha are they're um, both published by Integrate Ireland. And I did learn, I know Integrate Ireland is gone, but I did learn on Saturday, 
that they are downloadable. There's, you can get on and you can download worksheets. One of the women that helped put these together was in the workshop and she was telling me, you can download PDFs of, of work from here. And a lot of the people starting off, um, this is what we give them, the, you know, tutors, I give them this book to start off with to, to teach at this level. So if you can Google those, I'm not an expert on exact, but we, I know we've had copy of the copies of these floating around. So there might even be some copies of the books in your centers. If not, I'm told that you can download the PDFs of stuff. Um, I recently ordered um, a Long Bark Way to Reading. It, I, this I just ordered recently and Cambridge English has got unlock basic skills. Um, so those are two, two you could, I know you can get them because I just ordered them and they're good for, yeah, there's just not a lot you can order, but there, if you search, there are some things that you find. And those are a few of the things that we like and we've used. Um, picture dictionaries are great as well, you know, because, you know, just this is, you can get these at any um, ESL bookstore, but you know, you've got colorful pictures and then you can do worksheets around the, if you're doing food, if you're doing things in the town, you know, so they're really good and they're aimed at, at um, ESL students as well. So, um, useful websites, WordWall, I just learned that, about that on Saturday. So I wanted to add that to my presentation. It, it's just great. And then, you know, I, I put up some websites that I know we've used and other tutors have used. It is kind of a, a hunt and see and figure out what the best thing to do and cover is in your classroom. It's not, you can't just buy one book and then cover, it covers everything. So it's a little bit more work in that way, but um, there is things out there and you don't have to completely reinvent the wheel and make up everything for yourself. There are some, some good resources out there. Okay, I'll push on now. So what does success look like at this level? And um, Progress is slow. It's probably slower than in a, a higher level class, but and it is very rewarding. You know, it is success is a journey, not a destination. And just remember that every time a student um, does their homework, that's a milestone, you know, and you need to congratulate students for the smaller steps that they take. And one of my students, wrote a Christmas card out for her tutor. And that was the first Christmas card that well, first card she'd written, you know, and that tutor just found that so special because she knew where that student was coming from at the very start. She had trouble holding the pen, she had you know, to be able to write a Christmas card, it mightn't seem like a big milestone, but you need to congratulate yourself and your students every time that they achieve something because it is it is really encouraging. And I think for me, I often prefer working at this level in the sense that um, you, every, every milestone is, is just, they're so delighted with themselves. And, you know, the tutor obviously gets invested and in delighted for them as well. So every time they come to class, they remember the time, the date, they do homework. That, those are all milestones and you need to congratulate them on that. And so, Oh, another thing I just wanted to share, I know there's one more thing on this. If, if you are teaching at this level, I'd encourage you to um, connect with any other teachers in your school. We've got, there's about four ladies that are uh, men and women that teach this level in our school. And they will often connect with each other just for encouragement and new ideas and they share lessons. So once you've done a lesson that, that has worked well, you know, share it with, with each other, you know, um, because I think, Community of practice at this level is even more important than at the higher levels because you need support and you need encouragement and you need new ideas to keep going. And so that's pretty much, I'll just do a little overview of what we've covered. So we looked at how do learners present in the classroom and what, how do you know somebody's an ESOL literacy learner? We've looked at building community and why that's important and how to do that. We've looked at resources and ideas. Um, we've looked at what success looks like at this level. Um, so that's kind of a recap. So now if you have questions or if you have suggestions or anything, we have 10 minutes or so. If you want to, um, please feel free to shout in there. If so yeah, feel free to unmute please and, and give suggestions or um, I, 
give ideas for um, um, to Susan or what she said or to any, anyone else. And um, sure. Susan, I can just read out one or two of the comments maybe that might help. So Mary Kenny said, um, an air code could be very useful for people to, to know their air code if they need to ring police or ambulance or yeah, fire service, yeah. etc. Yeah, yeah. And Mary also suggested to categorize words such food words, rooms in house, family members. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, it's great, great for, yeah, and again, I was going to suggest particularly, like, if you guys have resources and ideas like that, because we can all kind of learn from each other, you know, any good ideas you have, or any, anything, but, yeah. That's um, Marie Thompson has said, it's possible to get lined template on the web if you don't like using a copy. Yeah, great, yeah, that's good. Um, and then my colleague Derv has put up links to Unshot and Fail, as well as some other resources. Oh, thanks, sir. You can click in the chat box there and and um, see see the links from John Fair. Also, paving the way the Nala or Nala resort paving the way and um, uh, the big picture. And um, so uh, here's a question, Susan. I don't know, or if this for anybody, Susan, and anybody listening. Hi. Any suggestions for numeracy resources? That's from Caroline O'Mahony. Um, I think, hang on, shall I see? This FIOC is numeracy, a lot of, oh, it does it, or maybe it's not. No, no, that's sorry, it's not, it's not. Um, okay. There, yeah, I know there are actually, I, I, I'm thinking of the ones we have in the center, and I think they're NALA stuff. I think NALA might have some really good numeracy. So NALA have a numeracy resource, which you can go onto the NALA website, nala.ie forward slash resources, and look for um what's the name derv of our numeracy resort um uh, it's a uh, brushing up brushing up yeah brushing so up mats yeah i put a link two, in the chat there there's okay. two brushing up mats number one is at, for lower level and number two is a bit higher level level two sort of qqi so there are suggestions and yeah. um, susan or anyone listening there's a a, a question from Deborah Murphy asking any suggestions on how to practice giving personal information such as PPS address telephone number and then she's a question mark data protection. Yeah, I but again that's part of why community is so important. You know, like you're not gonna maybe not do the first you know it's it is it's a hard one. You know that um yeah you're yeah I I just. I mean, I guess you have to trust, like if you're practicing your PPS number and they don't, they're not necessarily shouting it out to each other. Like, you know, they are practicing writing it and maybe they're saying it to me, you know? So yeah, that's a really good point though. Thank you. Like you do have to be aware obviously of, of data protection. You don't want them shouting out their PPS number to everybody in the room, but, but generally if it's in, you're in the same, everybody's in the same boat. So, you know, um, okay. Um, if there are any other questions or comments or ideas, could you just unmute, please, and 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 um, suggest them now? Otherwise, uh, we might wrap up, Susan. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um. I know something else come in. Uh. So Christina, thanks, Christina Stevenson, saying good practice in integrated and standalone numeracy provision levels at. And she's given a link there for Solace. Oh, great. So the uh, person who asked about numeracy, have a look at um, Christina. And uh, Mary Thanks. Kenny has also yep. put, these are, these are all in the chat box, have a look at the materials project development by a colleague in Northern Ireland, um, Bridge Project Online, the learning environment language skills. Thanks, Mary, for that. People can click on that. Uh, yeah, so Mary saying with all materials you can dip in and out. It, this is digital, okay? So yeah. thanks, Mary, for that. So, um, yeah. So I suppose, Susan, we might wrap up on this. Was anything else you wanted to add? No, just thanks to everybody for participating, you know. Okay, yeah. Um, so it just leaves me to say thanks very much for Susan. For Thank you. Making Thank a real you, Susan. Effort. Thank really you helpful. Very Thank you very much. Thank you, and, and really, thanks Thank you for all the effort. Thanks, Fergus, as well. It's great. Great to have you. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for hosting. Yeah, you're all very welcome. And thanks, Thank for everyone, for, for supporting it by joining in and 
Uh, there are two more uh, webinars later this week on Wednesday at 11. Uh, Friday. No, sorry, at 1. There's one on reading from Fiona Conk. Fiona spoke at the Tutor Forum and she did one workshop on Saturday. So she's doing a reading one at 1 o'clock. And then on Thursday at 12.30, Mark McGuigan from Tipperary ETB is doing a technology uh, webinar. It's sort of how to overcome the fear of technology for both tutors and students. So if any of you are interested in those, you can just go on the NANA website and register. So thanks again, Susan. That was great. Really informative. Lots of ideas, lots of suggestions, and we really appreciate it. Great. Thanks. There you guys. Thank Thank you. Can I ask, are they going to be recorded, um, the Tuesday ones and Thursday? Yes, yes, they're going to be recorded. And we'll yep, be able absolutely. to go to that uh, Thank it you. Be, it, it takes a little bit of time then to edit them and put them up, but all the recordings will be on the NALA YouTube channel. Yeah, so that's really great. Fun. Okay, and thank uh, you. Susan's presentation today, I'll email it on to all of you who, who read for today. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, Susan. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. you.